So, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the professional service group of Mercer County. And happy Aloha Friday. So for any of you meeting me for the first time or don't recall, if you haven't met me in a while, yes, I'm wearing a Hawaiian shirt on purpose. It is a casual Friday in Hawaii. That's what I like to celebrate every Friday. Casual Friday in Hawaii, Aloha Friday. And uh, also today is National Sticker Day. And so most of the people in the room do have a name sticker on. So that's why I chose National Sticker Day to celebrate that. And what's nice with having a name sticker, especially in a networking situation, um, it uh, makes it a little bit easier of uh, introducing yourself and saying hello to someone by name. So, uh, and stickers can also brighten up a day if you've got some cute sticker with sunshines or rainbows or something else. So, happy National Sticker Day. Uh, PSG of Mercer County is a group that is here for you, anybody that is in any kind of career transition. It doesn't matter why you are in a career transition. Uh, in my case, my company, twice companies, have uh, reorganized themselves, and I was impacted by that. Other times, people do decide they're going to take their career in their own, own hands, need the extra time uh, to look for just the right position. And other people have taken time off for personal or family reasons, whatever that is, and are getting back into the job market. We are here to provide you extra information, a little bit of guidance, certainly a lot of support to help you be more efficient and more effective in your own job search. We do have a lot of tools that you can use that we uh, try to make available to you. Among them, uh, we do have our website, psgofmercercounty.org, psgofmercercounty.org. It is always online. It is more than just a landing page for our site. It is over 120 web pages of content. There is a lot of information that is there. Uh, in addition, uh, what we have connected in our website is a connection to our YouTube channel. So uh, every once in a while, someone says, how do I find the YouTube cha channel? Well, in YouTube, you can search for PSG of Mercy County, or on our website on the right-hand side is a logo and link for YouTube that takes you right there. We have 123 videos on our YouTube channel. They are all uh, prior programs that we have done here. So it's all information. So if you're wondering about what we did last week, the week before, and so forth, even two and a half years ago, you can find content there from a wonderful group of presenters that are very supportive of us. So, um, and um, well, thanks to Bill, this program is being recorded. And if not by tonight, then by tomorrow, this program will be on our YouTube channel as our 124. We do also have our LinkedIn group. Our LinkedIn group is called PSG of Mercer County. If you are not yet a member of our LinkedIn group. I encourage you to join the group. All you do is search for the group in the LinkedIn group section, PSG of Mercer County, and click the join button. It's that easy. And we will immediately accept you into pending status. The reason why is we do uh, check our attendance roles, whether people have joined us virtually or in person, to see that you have indeed uh, attended one of our groups. We're trying to make sure that we're keeping out people that are just name collectors and list collectors, just people that join groups for the sake of their own need. So we're looking for people that really kind of understand and get job search, uh, are part of job search, have something a little bit vested in job search. So when you do a request, it may take us a couple of days, it's probably once or twice a week that we're checking LinkedIn and we'll check our attendance roles, either someone who has been here online virtually or signed in in person, and then we will accept you. If we don't find you, uh, we'll just send you a quick email through LinkedIn just asking uh, to verify that for us. Um, so today we do have our presenter, Bill, and I'll introduce him in just a moment. And as a reminder, in case anyone is joining us uh, since a few minutes ago when we started, uh, do keep your microphones on mute. We're trying to keep the background noise uh, from coming through accidentally. Sometimes you think that you're very quiet, I'm sure most times you are. But you never know if there's a knock at your door, or if there's a leaf blower or a garbage truck outside the window. That noise sometimes comes through and it's a little disruptive. And uh, if we do get a big interruption, we'll just stop for a second. We could either ask you or we can mute you, and then uh, we'll move on. And then the good news is, because it's recorded, I can edit that out of the recording. So that won't be part of the recording either. And so with that, uh, PSG of Mercer County is pleased to welcome Bill Amarold. As a career coach and mentor, Bill has helped hundreds of motivated professionals find their next job or make a career change very quickly with proven tools and one-on-one -on -one insights that highlight each person's unique value and passion. 
Prior to coaching, Bill had an extensive career in marketing, brand management, consulting, and advertising with several CPG, pharmaceutical, healthcare companies, including Procter & Gamble, Shearing Cloud, Johnson & Johnson, and Del Monte Foods. Bill has an undergraduate degree in, in industrial engineering from RPI in Troy, New York, and an MBA from Indiana University, where he was a graduate assistant career counselor in one of the leading on-campus business placement offices in the U.S. He always, he's always been active. He's always been an active in sports and in community activities. PSG of Mercer County is always pleased to welcome back career coach and mentor, Bill Amaret. Hey, virtual applause, virtual applause. Great, how about it, Bill? Hey, thanks, David. And um, thanks to everybody who's here this morning. I won't be able to see you because all I can see is my presentation, but uh, I guess questions in the chat or however, and there's certainly some time at the end. And um, I don't have my Hawaiian shirt on today, David, but there, it is in the closet. I could go fish it out, but it's too late for that now anyway. So uh, the presentation that I'm going to give today is a summary of a series of interviews, 13 of them actually, that I had with various career coaches, successful entrepreneurs, and um, executives on December 1st. And two of the people who were part of those interviews are here with us today, uh, Alex Freund and Alan Kirshner. So I will be giving you each of their summaries as to what allows for and what creates career uh, clarity. So, um, and if you wanna connect with me, uh, you can see my contact information at the bottom. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the best way to do it. My website is also there. And I have uh, blatantly promoted it throughout the rest of the presentation. So with no further ado, uh, just wanted to let you know exactly why this happened. Because I said to myself, you know, we're coming up to the end of the great resignation, sort of. We're coming up to the end of COVID pretty much, except whatever variants get out there. What's on the other side for 2023? So graciously, 13 people agreed to meet with me on December 1st. I uh, was behind this laptop from 8 in the morning Eastern time till about 9.30, but it was a truly energizing day with tremendous insights, many of which I'm going to be providing for you today. Um, I will also say that if you would like access to those 13 interviews, and they're about 40 to 50 minutes each, um, you can contact me either on LinkedIn or um, through my website, and I can get those to you. There'll be a fee involved with that, but I also am providing the ebook for uh, finding God's true purpose for your career. Uh, if you reach out to me, I will attach it to a LinkedIn uh, message or to an email. So, what are the uh, the backgrounds, the career transitions that each of the individuals went through? What insights and tools do they use? in terms of either their clients or do they use for themselves to get to the right place on quote unquote the other side, the other side being the good place, not necessarily um, the, the wrong side of the fence. So um, my background, as David mentioned, uh, primarily marketing, brand management, advertising, a new product development. I started delivering newspapers at age 10 and a half. That's the Lowell Sun, uh, which still is in print. Uh, my good friend from high school worked there until last year. I've worked with lots of companies, large, medium, and small. There's a list of them there. Uh, my personality, if you will, comes from the, the items that you see there. I've been in competitive sports since I was seven years old, before COVID, playing in a competitive men's basketball league in New Jersey. Uh, I've done a lot of fundraising and community activities, church-based uh, choral groups, et cetera, et cetera. As far as career counseling, I started in grad school. Didn't realize that it was going to be something that I did many years later. I had a, an assistantship, which significantly helped the finances in terms of graduate school at Indiana University. And we had 650 companies come through that placement office every year. There were about 30 staff and some other graduate assistants. Great place to learn the basics. And this was for people who were either finding their first internship or the first full-time job. Since 2013, I've worked with over 500 successful clients. I've been the MC at over 250 job fairs in eight states, and they're still happening. There's going to be some happening the second week of February, the 13th and the 15th. And I'm also the author of Finding God's True Purpose for Your Career. I worked with a colleague uh, up until last year named Henry Lesher, who has since retired, and I've taken the mantle of both the book and the work and moving it forward. 
So here's my coaching philosophy. God put us all here for a variety of reasons. Career is one of the most important. So it's up to us to define and manifest those reasons in the best way possible. Now, you could take career out of that um, statement and put life, but career really is one of the most important. So that's where I come from. And my goal is not to provide the answers, but it's to ask all the right questions. And I'll get into that a little more as we go forward. This is one of the other driving forces. It's in the first section of our book. If you can hit this bullseye, which is the intersection of these four circles, this is a Venn diagram that you may have seen uh, in junior high school math. But what do you love? What are you good at? What does the world need? And what can you be paid for? If you hit that bullseye, you're going to win and the world is going to win, most importantly. And we'll be going back and forth to this. This came up almost every conversation that I had back on December 1st. What is your purpose? What's your mission? Mission? What's your objective? Now, there are plenty of books out there in terms of what this means, both for life in general, career specifically. But what I have found is you got to look inside for these answers, not outside. I mean, there are some prompts about that, but look inside. Don't downgrade, downgrade your dream just to fit your reality. Upgrade your con fiction to match your destiny, which is part of your purpose, mission, and objective. So here's the list of folks that I had the wonderful experience of speaking with on December 1st. And there are nine career coaches here, three successful entrepreneurs, and a current uh, fractional and full-time CEO, COO. And their backgrounds collectively made a great mosaic for what I'm going to be presenting to you for the next several minutes. Their questions were based on these. What were the careers or jobs that you had before getting into coaching or whatever it is you're doing now? What made your transitions successful or not? And frankly, most people learn more from the unsuccessful ones than they do from the successful ones. How do they direct you toward career coaching, entrepreneurship, or whatever it is you may be doing right now? How have you given permission, if you will, to your clients or to yourself to create the career clarity that's part of what you're all about right now, and some examples of good outcomes, some examples of not so good ones, recommendations for others, and then I don't know who's on this call or not because most of you are on video off, but some of us are going to be looking at retirement either shortly, a little bit down the road, and I have several colleagues and friends who are already there, and congratulations to them. And what I've found in retirement and when I'm speaking to people about that is you need to plan your day out the same way you did when you were working full time, only for things that are more meaningful to you as opposed to whatever organization you might have been working with. So I started with Paul Sakala, who is a global certified development uh, facilitator, career development facilitator. He wanted to be an astronaut. And then he found himself 15 years in corporate aviation sales, basically selling the ability for sheiks, executives, politicians to fly anywhere they want in the world on a moment's notice. And he eventually got out of that because it was a 24-7, 365 role and kind of gradually and then full-time got into career coaching. He was the coordinator of career and professional programs at Morris County Community College. He's currently the manager of workforce development at North Jersey Partners. As far as transition goes, the teaching and education part from his perspective, he found the job search process to be very enjoyable. We had a several minute conversation on that. I said, you may be one of a hundred people who actually enjoy it. But by doing the education of it and in injecting his enthusiasm and passion for job search in general, he found that he was able to get recent graduates into a new position quickly. And he also participated in adult and continuing education not just from the standpoint of job search, but also creating the skills that they might have needed in order to get the jobs. And he went part-time then full-time as a career coach, and he has um, put some um, materials together related to project planning for any job search or job seeker. His ultimate destination was determined by uh, the Five O'Clock Club, and some of you may be familiar with that. It started back in the 80s. He became certified through that. He's also the author of Work Search Buddies. And several people during the courses of the conversation that I had on December 1st talk about the importance of not doing it on your own. You don't have to be a lone wolf to make it happen. His key insights, find and follow your passion, declare your worth. He talked about some people he knows who have very like kind of offbeat 
uh, career passions, but when they realize what they're worth, and we're talking artists and sculptors and things like that, make sure that people are aware of that. Don't undersell yourself. And frankly, 90% of the people that I work with either undersell themselves or don't know what they're really worth uh, to start with. Overcome the imposter syndrome. There's a mindset thing. He talked in the interview about, if I'm walking into an interview, you're going to have to tell me why I'm the wrong guy for this job. So I'm going to assume that I'm the right guy and we're going to have that conversation uh, along that mindset. Define your legacy. In, in his case, he wants to be known as the coach's coach that people go to and say, how do I handle a situation like this? He also spent a, a number of uh, minutes talking about, it's not about you. It's about the hiring manager in the organization. Listen for the real needs and how you'll resolve them. And one of the things that I say to people when I'm coaching them, if you hear the question or the lazy phrase, tell me about yourself, it used to be you'd go into your 30 or 60 or 90 second overview, uh, your elevator pitch, so to speak, but, but I have a different perspective on it. You can't really do a good elevator speech until you know what the audience is looking for. So this is how I coach people to say it. You know, there are a lot of aspects of my background that could be relevant for this position. Which ones would be most helpful to discuss to resolve the issues that you're facing right now? And you do two things with that. The first thing you do is you say you're there to help, you're there to support. The second thing is you force the interviewer, the hiring manager, the team, whatever it is, to put those issues on the table that are really important to them and why. Once you know that, you can cherry pick from your resume, your background, your accomplishments to let them know how you resolve those issues. Then you're not like a shark swimming around the bait, you're going right to it. So again, what, what Paul was saying, listen for their real needs and communicate how you resolve them. And as far as creating career clarity, and again, this is all on a conversation that's about a 45 minute interview, incorporate your life goals first, make sure that you keep your accomplishments list current in all areas of your life. And I see this happen all the time. I'm working with a, a, a client right now who's 25 years in medical and professional advertising. And it took us two weeks for him to pull up all the major accomplishments that he had done because he hadn't kept track of them. And once we did, his resume is dynamite because he's done so much work. Uh, plan retirement activities, like I was saying, just like you would plan any other day. Obviously, you're going to have some more time to relax when you're retired uh, versus not. So that was my discussion with Paul. Next was Terry Seaman. Some of you may know him. Uh, I met him through his wife, actually, through a choral group. Uh, career Transitions Consultant, Smart Moves Coaching, started out in learning and development, PSE and G, uh, Herx, uh, and I, that was before they became Herx Selenese, et cetera, Teleport and AT&T. He did organizational training and change, both at Rutgers, Corporate Learning Surface, uh, Services, and the American Management Association. So the downsizing that he had there led to outplacement because somebody suggested to him, hey, Terry, you'd be a really good coach. You've done all this learning and development. You've done all this training. So that's what he did. He had a, a formal certification program. Uh, he now does career services on several different venues, uh, both uh, in academia and in the private sector for executives. And he's doing all of them right now. He's uh, juggling different things at different times uh, and on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So he calls himself the strategic learning and change guy, or at least that's how he uh, described himself when he was back in the private sector. And he's written well over 400 blog posts with some memorable acronyms. I actually, uh, uh, when I see it, I said, oh, you actually can remember this stuff because Terry put some context to it. Um, his ultimate destination was as a career coach, primarily with the Ayers Group, but he's doing a lot of the other stuff that I mentioned earlier. He's the author of To Your Success, says that he's doing a revision of that book this year. Key insights, reinvention is invigorating for each coach and client. And one of the things he mentioned is the I see in you. Get feedback from others as to what they see in you because you may be blind to it. I knew a guy who had perfect pitch. He was one of the best keyboard players I've ever seen live and didn't know until he was 18 that nobody else had perfect pitch. He knew when he was seven. So recognize what your key skills are, what your power plays are, what your superpowers are, whatever you want to call them, and go with them. That's why you were put here. Shift focus and service as needed. COVID forced this, and we used a couple examples. Um, he's somebody related to one of his kids is um, the manager at a commercial produce company that delivered to restaurants, but of course that didn't happen 
during COVID. So they started delivering to residential homes, keeping the business alive. Glam Truck Warriors is a woman I know up in Bergen County. She was an esthetician, got laid off, nine-year-old daughter, and had to go to work. So she put all of her equipment and tables and everything in her trunk, and then she would go house to house for client appointments. Then she and her father outfitted a van so she could just drive, and she could get maybe three, five, six people coming to her while she was in the driveway at somebody's uh, home in, in some of the um, um, upper scale areas in Bergen County, and she would just do her business there, and she's killing it. She's looking to franchise this, et cetera. She could have sat home and collected unemployment and been miserable, but she shifted. So creating career clarity. Clarity creates a great future. And typically, there are no right or wrong answers unless somebody tells me they're going to rob a bank, and then I'm going to say, hey, it's probably not a good idea. My role, and Terry feels the same way, use powerful probing questions to arrive at what someone's purpose or passion is. What are you good at? Do others come to you for it? What do you love doing? Trust the process. There are going to be ups and downs through job search. No way around that. But if you're working alongside somebody who knows what they're doing and can guide you through those areas where there's rough seas, rough waters, think of yourself on a whitewater rafting trip, you're going around the rocks, you want to stay out of the eddy currents that are going to slow you down before you get to the open area at the bottom of the river. Um, he talked about the Pixley panel formula. The guy who was on Wall Street with a um, basically a panel over the front and the back with his credentials, and he was dressed in a suit and wingtip shoes, believe in yourself, put yourself out there and improve yourself. Continue to do that, and you're going to have a good outcome. And retirement, act on in your interests, fulfill your dreams. And sometimes he says working part-time really keeps you going. So next, Kenneth Lang. And I'm going to give a couple minutes to each of these, and I'm, I'm sensitive to the time. Um, David, so we'll be we'll be good there, but I'm going to cut some of them short later on. Um, he was an aspiring journalist during college and a program until he didn't like it, then went into business analyst type of work. He did a lot of work with Scrum, Waterfall, Agile, and an IT guy, more or less, and an introvert. But he was let go of in 2019, and it was a big release. I mean, he talked about it. You could just see his face open up to say, oh, it was, I didn't have to go to work doing this stuff. And he had been with several large companies with layoffs. He had a long layoff after 2008, which I can uh, speak to that as well. And then he gravitated gradually and then full time into a job search coach and what he calls himself as the LinkedIn introvert trainer. He and Marty Latman have built MyNetworkingCentral.com for events and speakers. Great website if you aren't familiar with it. He's done over 100 LinkedIn live broadcasts. And he highlights himself as an introvert. And when he finally, quote unquote, outed himself as that, he got so much positive response that he realized that was his area of expertise. And I told him when we were on the interview, I said, Ken, I've never met a microphone I didn't like, so I'm not an introvert. But people who can relate to you will do so in a way that's going to be ultimately productive for them. Because things like networking, when you're at events, he says, I go to those for an hour or so, and then I just need to go recharge. And I understand that, at least now. But you know, for me, those are events that I really, really enjoy. So working through job search as an introvert is very, very doable. And Ken is a perfect example of that. So you know, his insights, you may have lost your job, but you haven't lost your experience. You're always selling yourself, even if you don't realize it. Deliver a product clients want, not necessarily one to meet a time and date. And this is part of the Scrum and Waterfall and Agile methodologies. You know, you may not be able to meet the date, but if you meet what they want, it'll be good. Have something else in the background. And he's not the only one who spoke about a plan B. And there are several ways of doing it. And like, not without going into them, you know, uh, real estate, passive investments. For you Bitcoin enthusiasts, good luck to you. I guess it's going well now. I don't know. but the bottom line is have another thing going on in the background because at any moment, and all of you have probably experienced this at one time or another, that can uh, come back to bite you, that your primary source of income goes away. As far as career clarity goes, know what you can and can't do. And in his case, anytime he was networking, he needed to decompress, you know, shortly afterwards, okay, to make sure that he could come back and, you know, at full speed. Recognize what you do well, look deep inside and ask others for feedback. Very common is uh, 
theme for the day is looking inside and then asking others who are close to you for what they feel your your key superpowers are. And what did you like or not like about prior roles? And you have to have the credentials and the experience, particularly in the IT world where things change every 12 to 18 months, if not uh, less than that. Uh, my next guest was Ed Samuel, and he has had all kinds of different corporate roles, started out in finance and accounting for digital equipment, and then he seemed to attract more and more responsibilities, at least that's the way he described it, operations, HR, and a bunch of other roles. He said he would had 38 different paid positions uh, in his career, and he was laid off at age 46 and didn't know what to do. Um, after salmon fishing for a couple of months and donating uh, uh, or trout fishing, I think he said, after donating all that to food banks, because apparently he was very good at it, he sat down and he started to read the book called A Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. And he couldn't finish it because he didn't know. And then he started with a nonprofit ministry with an assessment tool. And this is what steered him toward what he's doing right now. He currently is a career coach, certified disc trainer, and a career assessment team leader he has a 1099 staff of between 20 and 25 at different places around the country and the world who not only do the career assessments, but also do resume writing and other parts of his overall business. Um, executive career and life coach since 2008. Key insights. You know, a lot of people will come to me and, and he and I shared this. So, well, you really wouldn't know what I'm going through because you've never done it. Well, yeah, I have, or I've done something really close or I've been in a culture and an environment that's very close to what you're talking about. As far as when he's working with client resumes and he's not the one who does them, but he will review them, 99% of them are rebuilt. And I will share that in 300 job fairs over nine years, or actually about seven and a half before COVID kicked in, I would say I've seen about 100,000 resumes. And I would say about 65 to 70% of them need some or significant improvement. And 20% of them I would never even send a high school kid out with. And I'm going to guess if you're on this call that your resume is in better shape than some of the examples I'm just providing you. But it amazes me how little people put into what it is that their real value proposition is. He had a couple examples of people who shifted in their careers. A med student who made a critical error uh, when he was doing his residency who ultimately became a canine police officer. What do you do before you resign? He talked about how many examples of quote unquote, the great resignation was a big mistake. And part of it, I think was a little bit of um, a pushback in the sense that candidates have been ghosted for years by hiring managers, recruiters, and companies, and they would just ghost their employers. They just wouldn't show up. Where do you send the last check? Who knows? But that's not a way to handle things. It, it's out of integrity and it doesn't leave you with a good taste in whatever it is that you're looking to do going forward. So what do you want to do next as far as career clarity is concerned? Use the assessments. And he talked uh, about a couple of them. CareerDirect.org, very statistically validated. My two favorites are DISC and Myers-Briggs. And I have looked into CareerDirect.org and I will be incorporating it because there are so many things that it includes that the other ones do not. The other ones are good, but it's not as comprehensive, I believe, as what uh, as he's recommending here. He also uses one called Personality ID, which was originally for church teams. Both of these are nonprofit organizations, so the cost is very reasonable in terms of you uh, taking the, those quote unquote tests and then getting the results. Then it was adapted for the private sector because it was so effective. My next guest was Meryl Canner. Some of you may know her from Jewish Vocational Services um, up in Whippany, and she worked there for over 20 years, and they had a reorg and a downsize, et cetera, that she was involved with um, about two years ago. Um, tremendous background academically, psychology and teaching psychology, and she's now working uh, as her own uh, career services specialist using all the skills that she developed over that many years and thousands of people that came through her program. And she kind of jokingly said, she's one of the few people who actually has been doing the coaching and counseling aspect of this type of work pretty much her whole career. Uh, so she didn't have some of the other backgrounds that the guests that I had before and after her. When she was downsized, she pivoted into her own business. And how does she support her clients in pivoting from one position to another? 
it's all about listening to them this is the way she described it. where are they why what's out what else is going on in their lives what are their key objectives what are the criteria what compromises might they be willing to make or not make in terms of what the job search is all about her whole uh, approach is to minimize the rough patches mourn briefly there are various stages of um, you know grief in terms of anger denial etc before you get to the point of okay let's move on and my whole goal with any of the clients i'm working with is to minimize the time there and this came from sports i have what i call the three second rule if i hit one in the woods i have three seconds to mourn complain about what it is then i shake it off and i tee it up again now sometimes you need more than three seconds to evaluate what the cause of a breakdown or the cause of doing something that didn't work well would be and i will devote the time to make sure that i understand what the implications were or what i did or didn't do to make something that didn't work or create something that didn't work and then move forward accordingly but the grief period is as short as possible because there's just no value in it you know if you lose a loved one and all that absolutely spend the grief period and do it but i know people who are still grieving over a lost loved one you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, and that's not serving them or the rest of the world either. So this is something that Marilyn and I spoke about uh, at some length. Um, again, ultimate career destination is really where she started, coaching and job search strategists, key insights. Listen, explore, do, and evaluate. In other words, if you're a candidate, listen to what's going on in the marketplace, find out what's there, explore, go forward, evaluate, and then circle back and start all over again if you need to give yourself permission to and there's a lot of fill in the blanks with that find out all of information you can about any of the organizations the individuals the industries that you're looking into so that you're as prepared as you can possibly be she talked about when her first one of her first assignments was working with retailers and she just didn't know how they did business so she would go through the stores she would take all their brochures to understand how their recruiting process would work so she could understand the nuts and bolts of that business. She's another one that said, don't do this alone. Explore other careers during job search. This is your time to make a switch into something that you may not have even considered before. What have you been successful doing and what have you enjoyed doing? Which is going back to that first Venn diagram that I showed you about Ikigai. What are your favorite activities inside and, and I find this to be tremendously important, outside of your career if you've had some things that you've greatly enjoyed outside of your career how could those be incorporated into what you do for a living going forward next was marty latman he has a finance auditing accounting operations background worked with several well-known companies including new jersey symphony orchestra i asked him if i could get tickets through him he said not anymore i tried um, his focus was on small and medium-sized businesses as a consultant, 21 different industries, tremendous diversity of background, but then focused in terms of making uh, these organizations be profitable and sustainable. And he also had an interest in HR and then coaching as kind of a sidebar when he was doing the finance, accounting, and auditing uh, work. When he was downsized, he pivoted into his own business. I first saw him present probably 10 years ago on handling ageism and then effective networking. And then he also talked about, uh, can you add more value than five competitors uh, or current employees? You know, put yourself in the eyes of the employer in terms of what value you're bringing to the party. And I'm sorry if you can hear a leaf blower outside here. I know, uh, David, you mentioned that earlier, but there's nothing else I can do. Hopefully it's not too bad. Um, Right now, coaching and networking strategist. Uh, he still does some consulting on the side, key insights. And if you've ever seen him present, he always says, always be positive. And he always says, always be networking. He mentioned also, and this was uh, you know three to five minutes of our conversation, transition creates a better person because you learn a lot about yourself. And I'll use an old adage that goes along with that. When the rocks are, when the, when the water is low, the rocks will show. And that's when you find out more about yourself uh, related to both your, your personal characteristics, your resilience, et cetera, et cetera. Landing is only temporary. Always be networking. And every no is one step closer to yes. So as I mentioned earlier with Ken, uh, they founded My Networking Central. 
Um, and he says, as far as career clarity is concerned, ask lots of questions, listen to the answers, and a recurring theme here, be clear about what you like and you do well and what you don't like and aren't good at doing. So my next guest is Donna Cornelius. I met her through a, an executive leadership program that I am participating in uh, a couple years ago as a student and now as a coach. She had background in theater and um, got a degree in that area, but eventually migrated into business and had a marketing content management company for 14 years. Currently works as a part-time and full-time CEO, COO, and one of her biggest uh, career accomplishments was making the Lehigh Valley Interregional Networking and Connecting Consortium work. She had three universities and hundreds of companies associated with that, um, created a great organization before she moved on about a year and a half ago. Uh, also was a consultant and wellness slash personal life coach. So she had a very a broad background in terms of not just career sustainability, but um, personal health and wellness as well. So gradually she progressed into sustainability and as a career mentor, which is another thing that she does now, she's very grateful for the freedom of time and finances to help others define what she calls as their zone of genius, superpower, areas of expertise, whatever you want to call it. Uh, she also talked about some insights um, you, from good to great, says you don't do anything by yourself, work with others. Again, a, com a common theme among uh, many of the guests. Create a mission statement that describes who you are. Hers is, I'm a confident, powerful, caring, connected woman. And that is what leads her and in a way of being with anybody that she interacts with. Do the best to overcome the following. You don't know what you don't know. And that is the stumbling block with a lot of people. Uh, senior executives who really don't know what's going on in the front lines, things can happen that they are not aware of that can really erode the business. I mean, the auto industry back in the 70s didn't realize that the Datsun B210s were infiltrating uh, the West Coast. And, you know, 10 years later, all these, you know, manufacturers from Japan and, and uh, Korea, and et cetera, who were meeting the needs of those who wanted smaller cars that didn't guzzle a lot of gas, they missed it. Okay, and that's well documented. Creating career clarity. What do you want? out of your life? What are your thoughts, words, and action toward that? Mindset is everything. And the training that we both participated in and have coached, emotional intelligence impacts your entire way of being. And there are a lot of facets to leadership, and I, there's a couple others uh, who have had other leadership experiences. My friend Harry, who I'll talk about in a few minutes, has actually published books on that. Inspiring others to align with your vision is the best definition that I've heard. And it's not the problem, it's how you see the problem. Uh, Lynn Williams, um, she's presented in, in David's group here at uh, PSG Mercer County several times. I've seen her there. Um, she's also very, very well connected in, um, let's just say the greater Philadelphia area, Bucks County, et cetera. Um, she's done lots of work, for-profit, non-profit, education, seven different industries. A, a really um, LinkedIn expert. She also knows how to get uh, resumes through the bots, the applicant tracking system sensitive resumes. Uh, she's uh, going for her doctorate in education right now, and she's the executive director of Great Careers Group. So again, several industries, disciplines, areas of expertise, and a lot of the presentation that she talked about the day we met was how to replace fear with confidence for your purpose-driven career on LinkedIn. And she went into a whole lot of you know, strategic and tactical approaches to make sure that you're communicating your best possible value proposition. She also, as greatcareers.org, talked about Boolean search, where you can find different organizations that line up with what you're going to do and other people who you can connect with that can help with your search. Um, she's a, I started out as a resume writer, LinkedIn profile creator, and she understands very, very well what keyword emphasis is all about. Uh, the strategies to beat the bots, have an unformatted, friendly resume to go along with your formatted one. Position yourself where you're going, not for where you've been. Where you've been has to support where you're going, but it doesn't have to be exactly where you are going. Uh, your resume, LinkedIn profile need to be in sync, and you need to tailor your resume each time. I, I say if you have to tailor it significantly, you're probably your first resume isn't that good. But specifically, if there are words that are part of the job description, absolutely do that. Career pivots are normal. And I've done some other research on this that say that 
those in their 20s and 30s will have six different careers before they retire, not six different positions. Distinguish yourself in a memorable way, memorable way in whatever way is necessary to do that. She had some good examples and some not so good examples that day. And be sensitive to keyword searches because it's what recruiters do every day. She has a weekly newsletter. Um, there are some, some um, websites that she gave uh, that can uh, help with your search and certain headlines related to it because people read headlines. They read subjects in email to see if they're going to continue reading further. Um, then Alex, um, and Alex is with us here today, um, and he likes to uh, commemorate the day he arrived in the U.S., which has a whole different uh, reason for commemoration these days. Actually, it was my grandmother's birthday. She was born January 6th of 1900, so there you go, Alex. Uh, when you made it to Ithaca that day and talked to the people at Cornell about admitting you, um, and glad they did. Uh, you spent a lot of time in the hospitality field. Uh, Hilton Hotels Holiday Inn, Hospital Food Service, Insurance, then Honeywell at New York, very happy years, laid off more than once, and then eventually became, and he's well known as, the landing expert, um, focusing on how candidates handle themselves in interviews, both, I would say, in their way of being, simple things like lighting and camera work and all of that, because interviews start uh, in this format these days. And... He's focused specifically on interview preparation because he realized that he enjoyed it a lot more, he was good at it, and he wasn't as good at some of the other parts of career coaching. So he will uh, send uh, candidates to others to do those things. Be organized and systematic about job search. He mentioned during our conversation that he's very organized on his computer, in his life, and all parts of things. And it really does free your mind when you're organized. You know exactly where you can find something. Focused on the forest before the trees. Find the problems in the interview and show how you'll fix them with example. And niche expertise is better than being a generalist, and particularly so uh, with him because people find him from all over the world. His personal attributes of patient and patience and organization have created some very, very good outcomes. And you need to understand the culture of an organization. He's lived in several different states. I have traveled to all 50 and lived in 10. Um, and he talked about the difference between a company in California and one in Iowa, and they are radically different. And he also talked about two really good books, uh, Passages, which was written about 30 years ago, and the update to that called New Passages by Gail Sheehy. And um, my friend Harry Campbell, that I've known since grad school, uh, one of the more successful corporate executives that I know personally, and also did some great stuff entrepreneurially as well. Uh, he started out as an East Asian history major of all things, and he quotes Sun Tzu on a regular basis. Um, marketing business over several, several companies, he started at Procter & Gamble, we both did actually. Um, then he went to Sprint for two different uh, tenures. He had a group of over 3,500 as part of his organization. Um, he's retired a couple times, he claims this time he's retired for real. And he's the author of the Get Real series, Get Real Leadership, Get Real Culture, Get Real Mindset. Uh, two reasons I would recommend those books. Number one, they are very, very short, simple, pragmatic. You can take them and put them into practice the next day after you read them. The second reason is that every dollar that he earns from the books goes to Head for the Cure. He found out nine months after he was married to his second wife that she had an inoperable brain tumor. They both dedicated their lives to this organization. They've raised almost a million dollars in 15 years through walkathons, through his speaking engagements, through sales of his books, et cetera. So, um, you know, again, two reasons to have a look at that Get Real series. Um, his transitions, and, and he and I have known each other long enough to, uh, you know, when we talk about them, we can do it with a smile on our faces right now. But he's had some very, very successful ones and some very unsuccessful ones. He was in a dot-com when the dot-com crash hit, and he had left Sprint to do that. So it was like, hey, who knew? he never been a career coach, but he is a mentor and investor for many local business owners in Metro Kansas City, widely known uh, in that area. And he's a huge proponent of effective networking. So uh, his insights, and this is stuff that I've, I've learned from him through the years, he, he has a very good sense of humor. Like when we used to jog together years ago, and that was saying something for me because he was the 10,000 meter record holder at Vanderbilt for 35 years. 
And he said, I've never been fast, but I know how I can put one foot in front of the other and keep going. And he would be, we'd be going along and he'd say, yeah, this hill may be long, but at least it's steep. And you kind of like, well, wait, and then it was like, look, I'm going to make it through. That was the whole thing, the resilience, the drive, the perseverance, et cetera. Know what you can and can't do, follow your passions. Um, and I, I believe I'm kind of running up on time here, but I'm, I, I want to go through um, Alan, who was one of my guests later in the day, uh, started out uh, in finance uh, and he got his MBA while working at GE. Then he was working at RCA, uh, found his way into the pharmaceutical industry. We realized that we worked at Shearing Plow uh, at or about the same time and even knew the same building. So that was kind of a connection point we didn't know we had. And he pivoted from financial management to SAP to coaching back in 2018. And he also uh, coaches in all areas of job search. He's very involved with the Career Network at Rutgers, and obviously he's involved on the board at PSG Mercer County. Uh, one, of his, uh, one of his adages is, be flexible, roll with the punches. And each person is different, follow your passion. And then he, like I, and like others who do this work, make sure that once you've defined your passion is how can you monetize it in the best possible way? So I had a couple other guests who are kind of more entrepreneurial, but in, for the sake of time, I am I'm putting them to the end. Um, Kristen Engen and Cassandra Robinson, and they are part of the 13 interviews. If you want to uh, see what they say about it, I have them summarized at the end of this presentation, which I will incorporate uh, before I send it over to David. But I'll just give you a little background on me. I wanted to be a professional athlete when I was a kid, and I played high school, college, semi-pro baseball for a number of years. Um, I still play in a competitive men's basketball league. They allow me to play as long as I promise not to dunk on them. And as a 5'9 Caucasian, there's no danger of that happening. I used to be able to dunk a softball into my 30s, that said. I did a lot of work in marketing, product management, consulting, and advertising, and I've been doing this work part-time and then full-time since 2013. My transitions were technical to business to one-on-one -on -one, to coaching. And I thoroughly enjoy it, both as a career development coach and executive leadership coach. My focus is on a unique value proposition. And it's something that I learned how to do when I was marketing products and services um, back with various corporations. What is it about the product or service that's going to be unique, compelling, ownable, valuable, and as necessary, affordable to the target audience? And some of the products I introduced were huge successes. Some of them I introduced were not. But each one of them had to have a reason for being. And that's what I say to my clients. Why are you in front of an interviewer or a recruiter? Because you can resolve the issues the clients are facing. I also co-wrote and then uh, wrote a version for myself called Finding God's True Purpose for Your Career. Again, if you reach out to me on LinkedIn or by email, I will send you a copy of that as part of being on this call today. And my ultimate career destination is where it is right now. I have some other life goals. Uh, that I need to get cracking on because I'm not getting any younger. Uh, again, the ebook is available today for finding God's true purpose for your career. But here, here are my insights. This is for what it's worth. Define your goals and objectives using the key exercises, some that I have in my book, some that I'm going to incorporate based on what Ed Samuel had said, and know what your unique value proposition is and how to communicate it. Those are the two single most important things that I could say to anybody who's on this call right now. And if you're in transition right now, it's kind of like a whitewater rafting trip. And if you work with a coach, I have found you're going to avoid the rocks and the eddy currents. And here's another reason. It's solely based on ROI and finances. For round numbers, if you're worth $100,000 a year, that's $2,000 a week, $400 a day opportunity cost for every day that you're on the sidelines. If somebody invests a week, two, three weeks of their salary and gets back to work a week, two weeks, three weeks of their salary before they could have on their own at a level that they deserve to be, their responsibility, their compensation, everything that goes along with it, it's worth the investment and you can write it off on your tax return. So I say it's like professional athletes, musicians, all have coaches, trainers, teachers, whatever it is, you can benefit from one as well. In sessions like this where you get the information for free, there are probably a couple things that you'll be able to learn, but working with somebody one-on-one -on -one toward the goals that you're trying to reach has always been, at least from my found, has always been valuable. Incorporate your life goals first. And I use an exercise that I borrowed from an author named Matthew Kelly. I call it the next steps in life. 
and it how do you manifest the things that you want to accomplish in your life in 14 different areas and you can look at it from today forward but i think a better way to look at it is from your hospice bed back to today if you said okay i'm such and such an age right now i might live to my 70s or 80s or 90s whatever it is what are you going to say to yourself that yeah i don't want to get to hospice without having done this those are the things you want to focus on create a workable plan of action and have smart goals and i don't mean just for your career related stuff i mean all areas of your life get the support you need to make it happen you can look on the internet and find dozens hundreds of people who have been successful in the areas that you want to be in learn from them and in retirement what do you want to do become accomplish and experience and i've said this to my wife who's retired your agenda can't be setting other people's agendas what do you want to do become accomplish and experience after seven years that she's been retired i'm finally getting through to her patience so that's it um as far as what i have for today if you want to connect with me on linkedin or by email um, I'm easy to find, Bill Amaralt, uh, Bill Amaralt7 at Gmail, and you can use this link, and I can send this to you if you, if you don't get the presentation right away, uh, to sign up to get access to all 13 interviews and then a free consultation with me related to what your career objectives are going forward. So, uh, questions? So, folks, this is your opportunity to ask questions. It's been a, a very fun and informative presentation. Clearly, we paid a lot of close attention to it. If anyone here or if you're online, just on YouTube, like Alex. Bill, I have a question. Can you hear me? We yes. Hear you. you said yes? I couldn't hear you. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, Bill, for the benefit of the people here on this call, I want to take about two minutes to role play with you on something you discussed a little earlier, because we have a little bit difference of opinion, not to say that I'm right and you are wrong or vice versa, but I want people to kind of be, be aware of it. You, at the very beginning, you talked about how you recommend to do this very common question, tell me about yourself. So how about if I'm the interviewer and you are my candidate and I say, Bill, so nice meeting you. I read your resume twice. Um, terrific background. Thank you for sharing. I don't want to read it again. Bill, tell me about yourself. Yeah, now, now you just added a whole different perspective to this because most people who are saying, tell me about yourself, haven't read the resume. They don't know they don't know what my background is okay so I'll, I'll just i'll start with that and then before answering i'm going to answer your question um if you're like younger than 25 what i'm going to say next is not going to work it's going to sound really presumptuous more than anything else but what i have said and i've seen some good success with this and i'm now responding to tell me about yourself as you just said it you know alex there are a lot of aspects of my background and i thank you for taking the time to read my resume that could be really valuable for this position, which ones would be the most helpful to discuss to resolve the issues that you're facing right now? Well, thanks, uh, I appreciate your answer. Uh, let me tell you what's happening in our organization. Every so often, we are just thrown into a new project that we had no idea anything about it. And uh, I ask you, for you to tell me about yourself because I really wanted to evaluate how you would uh, act uh, in a, such a situation. So instead of answering to me, you're just bouncing it back and asking me a question. How about if we do it again? Bill, can you please tell me about yourself? Well, now that I know that you have these projects that you're trying to define, I can speak to you about some of the work that I've done to take a new product development situation on a concept only and then turn it into a multi-million dollar business, which I've done several times during my career. I've also grown organizations from you know, two or three to 15 or 20, depending on the need, in order to support a successful product or service. And I, I can do some other things related to that in terms of defining the product and the positioning for the target audience, but that focus area is where I've had a lot of success at many points in my career. Okay, Bill, can, can I show you something that I'm showing every client of mine? Yeah, sure. Oh, why should I believe you? Yeah, okay. Alex has flashed. Okay, so, 
I, I am the interviewer and I am the buyer and I asked you a question and you answered very eloquently. I loved your answer, by the way. But what goes in my head right now, Bill, this is so wonderful, but remember who I am. I am the buyer. Just because right. you said what you said, do you think I'm going to take a rubber stamp and say, of course, of course, what a question. No. So what I'm looking for, for you to bring me an example so I can validate that actually what you did, not only that you have skills for that, not only that you're good at that, but also somebody applauded you and said, Bill is doing a great job. Yeah, and I, I have several. We have several examples of that, you know, both from marketplace uh, conditions and like, for instance, as and I'm and now I'm shifting gears slightly as a career development coach, I would send you to the 20 testimonials that are on my my LinkedIn profile that speak directly to how it is that I interacted with someone and the success that they had, you know, working with me. Now, clearly, that's not what I was saying a minute ago, but I would I would send somebody to the testimonials. Also having, and, and, and Alex, I'm sure you, you, you coach this in interviews, have your references ready. You know, if, if you spoke to Bob Nissen, who I worked with or worked for at Shearing Plow, he would tell you that I did what I just mentioned to you a minute ago in terms of the new product launches and all that. What I talk, typically say to my clients, the, the two most important words that you should be using in an interview is or are, for example, Okay. And several years ago, I even offered my clients, I said, every time you say, for example, I'm sending you a check for $100,000. <laughs> of course, I'm not that rich to, to do that. But no, I want to impress them that, you know, every time you say something, say, for example, because mm -hmm. really, the for example, validates what you really want to say. Otherwise, they just forget about it. Right. It sets it up as a story or as an as, as a situation that you're going to describe. And if you're using your car stories or, you know, circumstances, actions, results, for example, when I in this position, I did this and the results were that that has a much more cohesive and and and, and then there's there's you know, bookend to it. There's a you know, right. and, and all that. So. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. You, you did yeah. a good presentation. How could you summarize so many people so well? I don't know. I mean, I envy you. Well, I appreciate it, Alex. And, and, and um, you know, it was one of those things that I mentioned this earlier that that whole day, you know, I, it was it was a long day, but it was conversations like this and, and dialogue with people who have, you know, different areas of expertise, different perspectives that that I learned from. And so that energizes me in, in, in a very constructive way. And I, and I appreciated both you and I see Alan on, on here too, both of you uh, as being part yeah. of that as well. You're, you're a very good student. <laughs> now we do have a question in the room. For example, Bill Pagula is standing at the microphone. Okay. Uh, not quite. Okay, well I gotta be around. Now I can. Not into the mic. But anyway, my in the, early on you talked about keep your more your morning and what you are on your YouTube and your brief. Um, I would like to see how you address that as far as someone who is just laid off. I mean I'm thinking of myself and others after 20 years with a company, all of a sudden you're like that. Um, Along with that comes some anger and some uh, just a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I think you can short if you don't take the time to get your get your head together and you yeah. just go out. You kind of start at a disadvantage. What do you think? Yeah, I absolutely. You need to go through the stages of grief. And I uh, and I I'm, I'm trying to in fact I probably can pull them up here and give me give me one second um, and it, it'll it'll take me a second to do it but you cannot like it it's basically saying and 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 this is this is maybe a good uh, comparison it may not be 
but you've just gone through a divorce and you still have all the anger and bitterness associated with it, you really can't go out and date anybody at that point. Okay, so it's um, it really comes down to how do you get through it as quickly and effectively as possible. And the first time that you get cut from the team, which to me happened in, in, in my early 30s, and literally it was the first time I'd ever been cut from any team that I tried out for, any college I applied to, or any jobs that I applied to. I mean, I got rejection letters, but um, you know, in, in terms of that, it, it's, it's very, very difficult. But the best way that I would say it is, and, and there's some there's some other aspects of this that are that are outside the scope of of this um, conversation today. But the leadership training that I've gone through that creates a level of emotional intelligence and resilience that you may not have known you had before can go a long way towards that. Because you know one of the things that you know I, I don't say common knowledge, but not commonly uh, practiced is you know, every second that goes by is a second that you can't do anything about anymore. All right. And um, getting through the stages of, you know, anger, grief, denial, and then recognizing that like one of one of the speakers said, you know, they may be able to take your job away, but they can't take your experience away. They can't take your accomplishments away. They can't take you as an individual away. So I, I acknowledge you for the difficulty that goes along with um, being separated from an organization after the length of time that you were there. And, and that's a, that's a serious life event. And, and, you know, loss of a job is right up there with, um, you know, loss of a spouse and all this other kind of stuff that, that goes up there. It's, it, it's high level of aggravation and all of that. Um, so all I would say is that if you want to talk to me offline about it, I'd, I'd be happy to, um, to go to go there and I would also say that as much as we have a tendency to identify ourselves with our careers there's so much more to every individual than that and I don't know you at all except for you just making this comment but I know that there's way more to you than the 20 years that you spent at the organization that laid you off so that would be the place to start and then there's some other strategic and tactical approaches that you can take afterwards. Great, thank you. We've got a thumbs up from Bill. Any other questions, folks? Yep, so uh, why don't you come up to the microphone? So we do have one in-house here. Thank you, uh, Billy. Thank you for the question about the interview. When you are in a room and some of you are the background in Zoom and some of Yeah, I'm having trouble understand having trouble understanding you, so go ahead again. The technical question, when you have a Zoom interview, do you put the background or because some of you have a background, some of you do not have a background? And I I've read you know pro and cons for each of the approaches. So what is your recommendation? So in the Zoom interview, you, you use the artificial background. Oh, do, uh, yeah, I don't use the artificial background. I use a blurred background. The artificial ones, um, they have a tendency to kind of, you go in and out if you're trying to show somebody something. Just it, 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 To me, the blurred background is better. Uh, and that's just a personal preference. If you have an artificial background that you like, that, that has some imagery, that the key thing here, and, and Alex, trains on this too is to make it so it's not distracting okay make it so that if whatever it is in the background is not going to take attention away from the reason why somebody's having a zoom interview with you so you know keep the attention where it's supposed to be you have to be very careful with the technology because it, it's going to try to assume either a depth perception and if there's stuff that it doesn't understand, like Bill was observing, you might fade in and out or parts of you might. Maybe your head will disappear for a second or two and then pop up. Or the other, sometimes it works with color. So if you look at Alex's screen, he's got that blue background. Well, if Alex used an artificial background and was wearing a blue shirt, we'd probably just see Alex's face <laughs> without Alex's body. And, right. um, you know, and so you have to be careful. Experiment with it if you're going to use it. Maybe have a Zoom session before the meeting 
with a friend who's using Zoom and try to and you know see that it works. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Head off, folks uh, that are still virtual. Still got a, a group of you, a good sized group of you online. Going once, going twice. Okay. Well, um, Bill, this this was terrific. You know, one takeaway for me is uh, from this program. You know, transition doesn't need to be hard. Yeah, it, it's a shock when it happens. Similar to Bill's comment a few minutes ago, but creating clarity and what Bill did today, Bill Amaral did today, was he gave examples from interviews of how uh, 10 or 11 people created clarity. And maybe we can find some way from these examples to do that for ourselves. Um, you know, it helps focus our thought, which can be helpful, um, understanding ourselves a little bit better, and um, hopefully focusing ourselves for job search. So I, I think these are valuable lessons, and I really appreciated that it wasn't just Bill talking from, as a coach, as much as sharing experiences with others. And so I think that works out very nicely. Um, I, I, I like that um, one of your favorite assessments is Meyer Briggs. Turns out on February 10th, we do have Marianne Kennedy coming here to talk. Oh, about no Meyer kidding. Briggs. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, you are all welcome. Well, you're all welcome all the time, but certainly you may want to put Meyer Briggs in February 10th on your calendar. And uh, if you're wondering, um, Alan Kirshner is the person in the back of the room. Uh, well, there's also. <laughs> Nora in the back room, who's not Alan Kirchner. So um, if you want to talk to Alan about his experience, I'm sure he'll be happy to share that with you as well. So um, Bill, thank you so much. Uh, I, this, I'm, this was such a wonderful, warm sharing program. You gave a lot of great examples. Uh, and, um, I, and, um, so, and I think maybe to satisfy Alex, um, we believe you because you gave examples of others rather than just you talking about it. So that's, that's helpful as well. Uh, I want to let you know what's coming up for the next couple of weeks just before we wrap up the meeting. And by the way, when we do wrap up the meeting in, a, in just a moment, we will allow folks, those of you who are virtual, you will stay virtual, network among yourselves uh, if, you, if you'd like. Uh, and then those of us here will network among ourselves as well. Uh, but the two groups, unfortunately, will not be able to meet after the meeting. So, But we'll keep the group open for that reason. And coming up next week, uh, one of the people that Bill mentioned was Marty Latman. Marty Latman will be here next week. He'll be here virtually. He's not able to come uh, in person. Getting interviews through successful networking. Uh, Marty Latman is someone that many people call the best networker that they know. He's very well connected, and he has a lot of personal stories that he will talk about, as well as techniques that we can all use. So that's next week, the 20th of January, right here, both virtually and in person. And the following week, uh, January 27th, Jennifer L. Smith will be here. It's been a while since Jennifer's been here. A leadership mindset for success. And she is a leadership coach. I'm so glad. And she's busy as can be. It's hard to uh, get her on the phone or get, get her on time. So glad she's making time for us and for all of you. So that's what we have going on for the next uh, two weeks. In addition, uh, tomorrow morning, the Breakfast Club of New Jersey is presenting. It's a little bit early. Get up early, uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, thebreakfastclubnj.com, thebreakfastclubnj.com, and you can get a connection to their meeting, uh, which is also free. George Pace will be talking about a job skills odyssey, disruption-proofing your career in a post-COVID world. There's disruption all the time, maybe the economy, maybe uh, the pandemic, lots of different things, and he'll talk about techniques for disruption-proofing your career. And then also our cousin organizations, PSG of Central New Jersey meets on Mondays, PSGCNJ.biz, and PSG of Morris County meets on Wednesday mornings, PSGMC.org. So that is our program for today, and uh, hope that you're all doing well. Enjoy the weekend, and until we get to see you all real soon, hopefully at least by next week, we'll simply say, bye, everybody. <laughs>